Einen wunderschönen guten Nachmittag euch allen. Hello everyone. Hope you're fine. Ich hoffe, es geht euch allen gut. Sehr schön. So, ich will mich gar nicht lange mit der Vorrede aufhalten. I don't want to talk too much. Uh, I just want to introduce our very special, uh, special guest and dear friend. Ich möchte gerne euch äh, ohne große Vorrede jemanden vorstellen, unseren ganz speziellen Gast, eine gute Freundin des Festivals. And I would like to present to you Miss Donna Presley. Give a warm welcome. Hello, hello. It's so good to see you guys. Thank you so much for coming and for being here. And do you like my jacket? Yeah. <laughs> I had it made just for Germany, let me tell you, because it's of the military and because Elvis was here. So uh, thank you. But I may take it off in a little bit because it's hot. So <laughs> Donna, first of all, yes. it's not your first time here. No. I know that. Yeah. <laughs> But, um, of course, we are all looking for your personal perspective yes, yes. Uh, of Elvis as a family member. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, maybe you can begin by telling us something about your memories way back uh -huh. of your childhood. Yes. Maybe that would be a good entrance. Okay, perfect. Uh, but Well, Elvis has been famous my entire life. Uh, however, uh, I knew in the fifth grade just how big he really was and how important he really was. When I was uh, sitting in the lunchroom of my school, do you need to translate anything? Okay. And uh, this girl walks over to me and she says, I understand you're related to Elvis Presley. And I said, yes, that's correct. And she said, will you touch my milk carton? I said, uh, why? <laughs> and she said, because you have the same blood and the same DNA that Elvis has. And I'll never get to meet him. And you're the closest thing. So would you? So I said, of course. <laughs> I knew then he was huge. <laughs> But um, from the time I was 10 years old, uh, I spent all my summers at Graceland. Uh, with our grandmother and with Elvis. A lot of times he was there, sometimes he wasn't. So, uh, when, like I said, I spent every summer there. And then when I was about 14 or 15 years old, uh, my parents had come to pick me up to take me back home for school. So Elvis took me and my mom and my dad into the dining room, and he said, Aunt Nash, Uncle Earl, we love having Donnie, which is what he always called me, uh, live with me and, and uh, our grandmother, Dodger. So he said, I will send her to school, I will buy her a car, and I, when she graduates high school, I'll help her get into whatever she wants. And I'm thinking, yes, yes, awesome. My dad was okay with it. My mom said, uh, no. Uh, <laughs> she said, he said, but Aunt Nash, you know I'll take care of her. And she said, I know you will, but she's my little girl, so I think she needs to go home with me. But um, then when I was 17, Elvis bought the Circle G Ranch. Do, do you know where that is and what it, about the Circle G Ranch? Yes. So my dad started to work for Elvis, and so we moved on to the Circle G And we lived there in, uh, until 1969 when he decided to sell it. At that time, he moved the mobile home or trailer or caravan, whatever you, you would like to call it, onto the grounds of Graceland, right behind the house. And we moved into there. And so we lived on the property. Uh, well, I did until I married. And then uh, my parents lived there until they opened it to the public. So we were constantly at Graceland. Okay. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I was always there. 
Um, a lot of times Elvis was there. Sometimes he wasn't, but was extremely close to our grandmother. So I was in and out of Graceland every single day. So, um, you know, it's just part of, of a, a wonderful, wonderful time, you know, of Elvis being alive and our family being, uh, you know, there and, and everybody being together. And when Elvis was at home, it was, uh, my mother used to say it was controlled chaos because you never knew what was going to happen next when Elvis was at home. Uh, you know, he would uh, drive go-karts, uh, motorcycles, uh, anything that went really, really fast. He loved it. He loved shooting fireworks. Um, of course, the women, we all stayed in the house out of the danger zone. Uh, <laughs> Elvis and the men would shoot fireworks at one another. So they used Roman candles and they would shoot them at each other. And this one particular Christmas, uh, my mom had just bought my dad a brand new leather jacket for Christmas. So we go over to Graceland and uh, Elvis decides he wants to shoot fireworks. Well, as I said, the women stayed inside and uh, they were shooting fireworks at one another. Well, Elvis decides he wants to play a joke on my dad, which he loved doing, playing jokes. So he takes like four or five Roman candles, lights them, and sticks them in my dad's coat pocket. Well, of course, the coat catches on fire. My dad's coming out of the coat, uh, and Elvis is thinking this is hilarious. He's laughing. My mom walks over to him. Uh, you know, she comes out of the house, and she walks over. She says, you know I just bought him that for Christmas, right? <laughs> he said, oh, well. <laughs> but uh, then my dad, not to be outdone, shoots a Roman candle at Elvis, and it burns him right here on the neck. So he had to delay filming of a, a film, and I'm sorry, I don't remember which one it was, uh, for two weeks while his neck healed. <laughs> so uh, let me, uh, and I guess I, you probably want to hear some, just some general stories about what he was like at home. Uh, he was very kind, he was very warm, he was very loving, very generous, and I, I don't mean just of money and buying gifts, but he was very generous with his spirit and his time and, and caring about all of us. Um, I remember when I was 19, um, I became engaged to a young man. And so I took him over to Graceland to visit our grandmother and for her, her to meet him. And Elvis was at home, and he and I were sitting in the jungle room. So Elvis walks over and he kisses me on top of the head. Hey, Donnie, how are you? I'm good. Who is this? This is my fiance. And he went, fiance? I, I, yeah, yes, uh-huh. Uh, he says, well, he sticks his hand out. He says, hi, I'm Elvis Presley. Nice to meet you, you know. And then he says, by the way, Dave, uh, when are you and Donnie getting married? Well, I know he meant this as a joke, the young man did. It didn't come off that way. He says, we're going to get married when she can support me unto the style which I have grown accustomed. Now, I realize he thought it was funny. Elvis, not so much. I thought, this is not going to end well. I saw this muscle twitching in Elvis's chin. He went, nice to meet you, and turns around, walks out of the room, goes straight to my grandmother. Terror reaches then. Uh, he's upset. I'm not going to let her marry this guy. He's not good enough for her. No way in the world. I don't care what I have to do. She's not going to marry him. So the next day, I get a phone call. Come to Graceland. I knew what it was about. I walked slowly over. Um, I go into my grandmother's room. She says, sit down, Donnie. Okay. Elvis wanted me to give you a message, and he would have told you himself, but he was afraid he'd make you cry, and he didn't want to do that. I said, okay. There's no way you're going to marry that guy. <laughs> I was smart enough to listen to that, and so I broke up with him. 
I just wish that Elvis had been around for my other two relationships. <laughs> they probably would have turned out a whole lot better. <laughs> So as you can tell, he was very protective over everyone and very loving and kind. So um, another story I'll tell you about that's really special to me uh, involves my son. So um, my son was three months old, and so I took him over to Graceland to, you know, visit with our grandmother, Dodger. And Elvis and Linda Thompson walked in from the swimming pool. Now, he had on swimming trunks a robe, and his hair was everywhere, and he still looked like a Greek god. You know, I was like, <sighs> but uh, anyway, I, he walks over to me, of course, again, pats me on the head. Hey, Donnie. So, hey, Elvis. He said, uh, who's this? Because my son was laying on the bed, and I said, that's my son, and he said, may I pick him up? I said, of course. So he picks him up, because Elvis loved babies and children. He picks him up, and he takes him over to the chair, and he's bouncing him on his knee like this. Well, my son had really thin, fine hair at the time, and it stuck straight up. So I kept a cap on him. Well, the cap fell off, and the hair went like this, and Elvis thought that was hilarious. So he says... I'm going to name you Little Elmer Fudd. You remember the cartoon character? So, like I said, he had a nickname for everyone. So he was kissing him on the back and the neck and playing with him, and he said, what's his name? And I said, Stacy Aaron. And he just stopped. Aaron? Yes. That's my name. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> I named him after you. Tears welled up in his eyes because he was so honored that I would name my first firstborn child after him. But he didn't want to become too emotional. So he says, okay, how you spell it? I said, A-A-R-O-N. He said, that's right. So if anybody, if there's ever a question about how he spelled his middle name, you heard it here, A-A-R-O-N. So he looks down at my three-month-old son, and just to show you how he wanted to keep family close, he looks at my son and says, okay, Stacy, when you turn 18 years old, you come see me. I want to put you to work. So there and again, that shows how he loved his family, how he wanted us around. And it's because that he knew that we loved him as Elvis, he didn't have to be Elvis Presley. He just had to be Elvis, and we loved him. So, Are there any questions, or do you want me to keep telling stories? Well, <laughs> I will ask. Okay, I will ask. So, I have a question about the music. In the beginning of the 1960s, there came a new kind of music in the scene, like uh, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the Beach Boys, no? Did Elvis like this kind of music, this new music for these times? Uh, yes, he did. I mean, he listened to uh, all kinds of music, all genres. He liked uh, classical music. Uh, he liked uh, listening to other artists. And he felt that there was room for everybody. Uh, I know there was this, this big deal, you know, said that Elvis, there was a rival between Elvis and the Beatles. They actually met each other and, and enjoyed each other's company and had a really good time. Um, so Elvis said, you know, there's room for everybody out there. So, uh, yeah, he loved it. I mean, one of his favorite artists was Roy Orbison and uh, also Ann Murray. So he listened to everybody. Hello. Hello. Um, I have a question. Um, I read some books. Mm -hmm. One from Kathy Westmoreland. Yes. One from Larry Geller mm -hmm. and uh, Charlie Hodge. Mm -hmm. And I saw an interview uh, with David Stanley mm -hmm. and Susanna Lee. And all of them claimed the same thing, that Elvis had cancer. And Kathy Westmoreland even stated that Elvis told her herself. So I would like to know, do you know anything about this? Is there any truth to it? 
um, or is it even true? Is something true, just a part of it, or is it just? Uh, I've, I've never heard that, uh, that he had cancer. I mean, I've heard that people said that. Um, to my knowledge, he did not. He had lots of medical problems, uh, enlarged colon, he had glaucoma, you know, he had heart problems, and unfortunately, every member of the Presley family has passed away with congestive heart failure. Uh, so that's always been a, a congenital problem, you know, uh, the, the fact that heart problems. Thank God I don't have that, but, you know, <laughs> thank you, Lord. Uh, but really, um, there were, he had a lot of medical problems, and, and even, they even stated that they were surprised that he didn't pass away on stage because he was constantly moving and, and you know, trying to make sure everyone had a good show. But to my knowledge, he did not have cancer, no. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, are you still in contact with Priscilla? This is my first question, and my second is, uh, have you ever met um, Colonel Tom Parker, and what do you think about him? Uh, no, I don't have, like, daily contact with Priscilla. Occasionally, we will run into each other because we happen to be at the same events. Uh, but, no, I don't keep in contact with her. And also, Colonel Tom, I did meet him on, on two occasions. Um, he was... Uh, <laughs> um, rather boisterous um, and kind of um, a, a, a hard kind of person, you know. Um, he wasn't very friendly. He was just, it was all business with him all the time. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's the best way I can describe him <laughs> and still be nice. <laughs> At, at first, thank you for being with us here today oh, well, my and uh, sharing this wonderful weekend with us, with all the other Elvis enthusiasts and um, all your effort for coming over. Uh, my question is, um, mm -hmm. do you have any memories about Elvis talking about his time with the army and especially being in Germany and what impact did it have on him? Did he change in a way, or what was his experience influenced at him? Uh, he loved he loved Germany. Uh, he loved being here. He enjoyed being in the in the service and serving his country because there was one thing that Elvis was always known for. He was always known to stand up for his faith in God, his love of family and friends, and for his country. So he was happy to serve, um, and. He, I mean, was he worried about the possibility of, you know, will they forget me while I'm in, in the service? Uh, we all know that that didn't happen, of course. But, um, you know, he, he wanted to serve as a regular soldier. He could have gone into what we call the USO, uh, where he could have just entertained the, serve, you know, the soldiers around the, the world. He didn't want to do that. He wanted to serve as a regular soldier. And, uh, you know, I mean, it was, uh, of course, in a way, terrifying for him to come here and, and to uh, serve as a, as a soldier because not many soldiers have girls clamoring at the train station, you know, and crying <laughs> for them, you know. Uh, so he, he knew that there might be a, a bit of jealousy or so forth with other soldiers. But he served just like they served. He stood beside them. He did KP duty. He marched. He, you know, did the perimeters of, of security and so forth, um, cleaned jeeps, what it, whatever needed to be done. Elvis did it just like the other soldiers. And in doing so, he earned the love and respect of not only his fellow soldiers, but of his commanding officers. So um, he, he enjoyed his time here. He loved, like I said, he loved Germany. He always wanted to come back to Europe and travel all across Europe and perform for the fans because you all meant so much to Elvis and he loved each and every fan that he had and he wanted to be able to have that energy and that love flow back and forth between all of the, his European fans, just like the American ones. 
uh, and him. Uh, so he wanted to come back. He always wanted to and fully intended to, but unfortunately, his time was cut short and, and he wasn't able to. So uh, I hope I answered your question in, in that respect. But yes, he always, he, he enjoyed it. And did it change him? I, I think that, uh, yes, of course, I, I don't think that you can serve your country or do anything in service like that um, without it changing you and, it, and touching you and making you a better person. Uh, and although it's wonderful and perfect and everything this as he was before he left, he was even more so when he came back. Yes. Yes. It's my turn. Uh, I'm uh, so glad to have the possibility to speak with you, Donna. Thank and you. Uh, we are a group of people from Italy. Mm -hmm. where we love uh, Elvis in Italy too much. Thank and, you. And um, I have just a little... Two questions. Yes. Uh, I knew it uh, that uh, you uh, are involved uh, uh, for uh, the Circle G and uh, is um, a future. Mm -hmm. So I ask uh, about uh, is there is some news about it. And uh, the second one, uh, I know that uh, your mother, Nash, uh, um, are very close to Elvis and mm -hmm. so. How um, have you um, live uh, the death of Elvis? Uh, as far as the Circle G is concerned, uh, yes, uh, there is a foundation called the Circle G Foundation, and they're trying to get it restored and so forth. Um, there's been several people who've tried to buy it, but for some reason it, it didn't work out. Um, I'm praying and hoping that there will be someone who can buy the Circle G and restore it to its former glory and beauty. Uh, unfortunately, the, the people that own it now have let it run down. The, the house and, and everything is, is uh, quite run down. So we're, we're, you know, really searching for someone that can buy the Circle G, restore it, and make it a, a destination for fans to come to, just like Graceland and, and Tupelo. Um, as far as my mom and Elvis, yes, um, my mom was nine years old when Elvis was born. So they lived next door to each other. And so my mother, you know, she babysat Elvis. She played with him. Uh, they were, remained close all of, all of Elvis's life. And my mother was a, a, an Assembly of God minister. And uh, Elvis wanted to help her with that. And so he... Uh, calls her over and he says, Aunt Nash, I understand you're, you're going into the ministry. And she said, yes. He said, I want to help you with that. So he buys four acres of property in Mississippi, uh, not far from the ranch. He um, then calls her over and it's the next night and he says, Aunt Nash, do you have a car and for your ministry. She said, she said, he said, I want to give you a car. And she said, honey, you gave me a car last night. And he said, no, no, no. That was a family car. This is just for you and your ministry. So um, he takes her to the Pontiac place. And he says, pick one. She says, no, honey, you pick it. So he takes her by the hand, and they walk around the, the uh, car lot. He walks over to a uh, Grand Prix Pontiac, sky blue with a white leather Landau top and white leather interior. He opens the door. He sets her in it. He kneels down beside her on the ground, and he prays. And when he stands up, he said, this is the one. So he buys it and takes it home. So... He calls my mother up the next night. Aunt Nash, come to Graceland. She walks over to Graceland. He says, do you, uh, do you have a piano for your church? No, not yet. Come with me. He takes her into the music room at Graceland. Do you, you remember the gold grand piano that Priscilla bought for Elvis for an anniversary present and had it gold leafed? Okay, this piano's nine foot, okay? Huge. 
So he says, here's your piano. So my dad, who was felt, it, he was a kind of a jack of all trades, thought, why hire someone to do something you can do yourself? So he wraps this, this, this gold leaf nine foot piano in moving blankets and puts it on the front end of a tractor. He then takes it down the, the drive at Graceland, through the gates, turns left onto Elvis Presley Boulevard, drives to my mom's church in Mississippi, takes it up on the hill, and he's sitting there looking. And she, he said, uh, my mom says, what's the problem? It won't go in. <laughs> my mom said, well, can't you take the wall down and put it in and then put the wall back? Yes, I could do that. But then there would be no place to sit. <laughs> so, back down the hill, back onto the uh, nail road, back down Elvis Presley, back up to Graceland. My mother goes over to Graceland that night. Elvis, yes, Aunt Nash. You know that gold piano you gave me? Yes. Well, it won't fit. So do you mind if I trade it for something that will? He said, Aunt Nash, I gave that to you. You can do whatever you want to. You can burn it if you want to. It's yours. Now, my mother was like Elvis in the aspect that she cared nothing about money except what it could do for others. So she goes to a music store in Memphis and says, would you mind trading me a spinet piano for this gold leaf baby, you know, gold leaf grand piano? Of course we'll do that. <laughs> so that's what she does, straight across the board, no money exchange. So then, uh, from what I was told, that gold nine-foot grand piano that belonged to Elvis was then sold to a private collector for $2 million. That could have been my inheritance. <laughs> but at any rate, my brother now has the spinet piano that, that once belonged to my mom. It, also, it, it set the gold piano set in the uh, Country Music Hall of Fame in Nashville for many years <clears throat> with this story beside it. Uh, then the Hard Rock Cafe built a new casino and uh, hotel in Tampa, Florida. That piano is now the centerpiece of their collection. So if you ever get to Florida, go see it. <laughs> Okay, uh, ma'am, I think you just uh, answered a part of my question, but uh, uh, I will ask it anyway. Uh, in your everyday life, I mean, having a superstar in the family, mm -hmm. how present was this fact in your everyday life in the 60s and 70s? I mean, you had your own family, your own life. Mm -hmm. um, let's say this, it didn't suck. It was awesome. <laughs> Uh, you know, we all knew that Elvis was, you know, a superstar. But to us, he was just Elvis. Um, he always said, he would tell them, the maids or, or whoever, you know, that happened to be around, don't treat me like a star in my own house. He just wanted to be Elvis. Um, it was... Um, he just loved, he loved what he did. He loved performing. He loved everything about it. But he also just wanted to be a regular kind of person when he was around family and friends. Um, it was awesome. I mean, completely and wonderful and perfect in every way to be able to have this, this man in our lives. And not just because he was this wonderful performer and, and 
the greatest entertainer that ever lived, and that goes without saying. But he was also one of the finest men to ever grace the stage of life. He was so kind and so loving and so warm and so generous in every way, monetary and every other way, which was even more important. And he, he taught all of us so much. It's very difficult when you reach the pinnacle of success that Elvis had uh, to maintain a regular, normal life in, in your own, own home and, and around family. But because we were around and because we loved him no matter what uh, or no matter who he was, it, it made it easier for him. But uh, there were, you know, there were times that people would, you know, well, let me tell you, let me tell you this a story that will just uh, kind of explain all this to you. My mother always said that Elvis was a bird in a gilded cage. I never understood what she meant by that until one night I was spending the night at Graceland. And uh, I was in my grandmother, our grandmother's room. And she went into the kitchen for something. And Elvis walked in to the bedroom. And he came over and kissed me on top of the head. Donnie, hey, how are you? I said, I'm good. Well, I'm sitting in a chair like this. He sits on the floor in front of me, crosses his legs, and he's asking me about my life. Who are you dating? What are you going to do when you graduate high school? What, you know, whatever. What is it that you want? And uh, he said, uh, you know, Donnie, I envy you. <laughs> You're Elvis. <laughs> Why do you envy me? He said, because when you meet a guy that wants to take you out on a date, you know he wants to take you out because he likes you. He wants to be with you. When you have a, a, meet a, another girl that wants to be your friend, you know she wants to be your friend because she likes being around you. She likes hanging around you. I don't have that luxury. I never know if someone that I meet and bring into my life, and, you know, that's new and that I bring them into my life, do they love me because I'm Elvis or do they love me and want to be around me because I'm Elvis Presley? And that's when I realized how hard it had to be for him and how, why he loved having family and close friends that he had known for years always keep around him because he knew we loved him because he was Elvis and not because he was Elvis Presley. Now, for us, we would receive a little bit of that in the aspect that, you know, I, I lived at Graceland. I lived behind the house. Everybody wanted to go home with me. Um, so I had to be selective. But, uh, I mean, it was, it was fantastic, you know. I mean, you're, you go to a concert, and you're sitting there, and there's thousands and thousands of people there, and flash bulbs going off the, to where it looks like it's daylight inside the building. And you're in awe of this man, just like everybody else is, because of the tremendous talent that he had, the tremendous charisma, tremendous looks. Elvis was the whole package. And he always said, you know, I've been blessed by God, and only God could have given him everything that he had, which because he had it all. So he wanted to give back not only to his family, not only to his friends, but to perfect strangers. He said, God's blessed me so much with what I have and being able to do what I do. It would be remiss of me if I didn't share it with others, whether he knew you or not. For us, it was just, it was amazing. It was fabulous. We could go to a concert and see all this and we'd be just as amazed and, and engrossed in watching him as anybody else. The difference was we got to go home with him. So to, to be honest, it was awesome. <laughs> ein wunderbares Schlusswort. Ich muss immer so einen kleinen Blick auf die Uhr werfen. Ähm, 
Und ich danke euch schon mal für, für eure wunderbaren Fragen. Um, I just told them that this was a very good finale here. And uh, I would like to thank you all for your, for your wonderful questions. And of course, I would like to thank you, Donna, for being with us and for sharing those stories and for sharing the perspective of a family member and a very warm hand for Donna Preston. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're gonna make me cry. <laughs>